What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 228 at block height 638,811, Saturday, July, or, yeah, July 11th. What's going on, Janine? You know, Shinobi, I just feel like we should rename this show to the con base uh, corner, because I feel like we're always talking about Coinbase should just make a segment just for them and and if there's nothing newsworthy then we can just talk shit for for like five minutes yeah i think this has been a pretty dense uh week news wise in and out of bitcoin yep it definitely has well i guess uh yeah want to just dive into this first bit of, of shenanigans um seems to be a lot of uh larping and caps and libertarians who uh had no problems with free money yeah so coindesk has been um building a list of bitcoin slash crypto slash blockchain related businesses that have received ppp loans because um that list was recently released um, as they write in the article the u.s small business administration or sba published details of its paycheck protection program ppp on monday revealing a who's who of major and minor firms in the industry um who had received money um they say the ppp for anyone who isn't american and may not know the ppp was created by the trump administration during the covid the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak to help businesses to pay their employees during the ongoing economic crisis. The effort was meant to stem layoffs, though some 44 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits since March. And yeah, that does not seem to be slowing down. Um, So fuck all that did. Um, Well, part of the reason is probably because of some of these companies, but um, yeah, I'm going to go through a list of some of the companies that appear on that list. Um, But I also want to preface this by saying that there have been a few instances where either the companies listed uh, by Coindesk or even apparently the SBA were mistaken for or improperly written um, to be mistaken for a different company or the information presented in the database is wrong which could be a whole topic in itself about how responsible this program actually is if they can't even get basic information about companies correct uh, in a database like this that they're publishing to the public. Um, But if you want to look at the list yourself, the SBA PPP list is linked in the show notes. Um, So something I find interesting before, (laughs) before we go in is that there was also an article published by The Block um, which is, uh, as far as I could see, it was a much shorter list, but they are attempting to build their own list. And I found it interesting when I looked at the article that they did not disclose the fact that they also appear in the database, which I found kind of funny. Like, you know, you're <laughs> writing an art. You're, you're, I mean, unless, unless maybe they're not aware that they've been erroneously included on the list, um, that's possible, but most likely... I mean, there aren't that many companies out there called The Block. Um, But I do find it interesting that they didn't disclose that. Uh, But first off, on the uh, honorable mentions, uh, Consensus. Consensus received between $5 million and $10 million in April from Signature Bank. 
Um, yes, the consensus that is run by the so-called crypto billionaire Joseph Lubin, who has been throwing millions of dollars to bullshit projects over the years, apparently needs a bailout in, to the tune of millions of dollars. Um, I mean, you know, I would have suggested maybe uh, trying to reclaim some of the money that you gave to projects like Civil, which you basically, I mean, in that case, you bailed them out because they had a very clearly failing project um, and you still gave them millions of dollars, which ended up ruining the governance model that they claimed they were trying to build because it made you the majority token holder. Oops. But apparently this company needs to be bailed out. Um, another honorable mention. Compliance firm CypherTrace received between $350,000 and $1 million from First Republic Bank in April. Again, blockchain surveillance getting bailed out by the state. Cardano maker IOHK USA LLC received between $350,000 and $1 million from Bank of America in May. Uh, Charles Hoskinson Hus actually tweeted in response to people who pointed this one out by saying... Uh, I pay millions in taxes every year, and the U.S. government decided to shut down the entire U.S. economy. The point of these loans is to maintain small businesses while they get brutalized by COVID. Would you rather go to Amazon and Microsoft? To which some people responded, actually, yes, um, because as much as we have a lot of reasons to hate both of those companies, they actually provide a useful service <laughs> in some contexts. Um he also he also had the gall to publish. Uh, I it must have been on some kind of live stream that he did or something. But there was like a clip from a video that he did, where he claimed that by taking money from the PPP program, or PPP because program is actually in the name, um, he was effectively subsidizing Bitcoin development. Apparently, dramatic pause for effect as you digest whether that's bullshit. Yes, yes, it is. Yep, it still smells like bullshit. I uh, have to scroll a bit, one second. Uh, another honorable mention. Electric Coin Company received between $350,000 and $1 million from New Tech Small Business Finance in April. Um, now this one is particularly interesting because I think of all of the companies that received money, this one, uh, <laughs> this one caught the most attention. Because, um, as it was pointed out by Peter Todd, they in the database they were designated as a Hispanic female-owned business. Um, for anyone who remembers, this may harken back to the time where consensus, uh, erroneously or not, was registered as a, uh, I think it was a small disadvantaged business when they were trying to do some contracting stuff in Washington, D.C. And that was caught out by someone. And then I think... Uh, I can't remember her position, but there was a woman who replied, um, who worked at Consensus at the time, who said that that was an error. It's amazing how many of these errors tend to be stuff that could work in their favor, but I digress. Uh, yeah, so female-owned, uh, Hispanic female-owned business. Now, assuming that the standards for what constitutes a female-slash-women-owned business is the same under the PPP as it is for government contracting, a woman-owned business um, basically means that it is a business that is at least 51% owned by one or more women, or in the case of a publicly owned business, at least 51% of the stock is owned by one or more women, and also the management and daily business operations are controlled by one or more women. That is what constitutes a woman-owned business. Um, what constitutes his, a Hispanic-owned business, that's another thing, because... Uh, I don't know what the standards are for that. I didn't have enough time to look it up. But regardless, anyway, this is interesting and confusing because as far as we know, there isn't a Hispanic female owner of Zcash. And so when I saw this, I thought it was maybe possible that in applying for this PPP loan, they may have used their registered agent, who is named Margaret Bailey, as the majority shareholder. Um, or majority owner, since she is also involved in Zuko's uh, least authority company as well. But based on her pictures and description, I don't get the impression that she is Hispanic, but it's possible. Um, but then yesterday, uh, the Zcash, or the, 
Electric Coin Company tweeted, it has been reported that ECC applied for and received a PPP loan. That information is correct and is available at the link below. The information reported by the SBA shows that ECC is a female and Hispanic owned, uh, is, is female and Hispanic owned. That is not correct. ECC applied for the loan to protect our employees against financial risk due to the COVID-19 pandemic as the price of Zcash and other cryptocurrencies dropped along with a, the broader market news of the shutdown. Well, not all cryptocurrencies dropped. Um, we depend on Zcash to compensate our employees who work tirelessly on initiatives in support of Zcash and the Zcash community. Our loan application was specific to ECC's US-based employees. Uh, while the coin price has since rebounded to a degree, the U.S. remains in the grip of a pandemic and market uncertainty remains. We will, we always have and will continue to be good stewards of our financial resources in support of the Zcash community. Uh, then they explained that the, the application form that they filled out did not include questions about gender or ethnicity, so they don't know why that was included in the database. And they say that the SBA does not factor in gender or ethnicity as part of eligibility, which um, regardless of whether, I haven't checked whether that's true, but could be the case. Um, and then they were saying that they're actively working with the bank to find out the reason why that error occurred to get it corrected. Um, so yeah, but one thing I do want to point out here is part of the reason why people were upset is because there have been numerous reports that specifically black and women owned businesses um, tended to not receive loans through this program um, for a variety of reasons, actually. Um, it didn't actually help for them to, if whether or not they designated their status, it didn't actually end up helping because part of the program requirements, I believe, is that you have to have a credit relationship with the bank and especially um, a lot of black owned and women owned businesses, they also tend to be smaller and uh, have fewer resources. And so they would be applying for loans that are smaller and they would also be less likely to have a credit relationship with a bank, especially if they might have lost it, um, if they might have lost it when the pandemic started and the lockdown and everything. So that's probably why people were particularly upset about that one because there are a ton of businesses that are black owned are actually black owned women owned or hispanic owned businesses and they have not been able to get loans for much 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 smaller sums of money um so i will scroll again to continue on the rest of the list now the the next one was uh, quite surprising um Mobile coin received between three hundred and fifty thousand and one million dollars from Blue Ridge Bank in April. And if you don't remember, uh, mobile coin was what we covered in BD episode sixty four, which is basically an SGX SGX based Monero ripoff that Moxie wants to add to the Signal Messenger app that hasn't even launched yet. It's basically just a website. Um, and last time I looked at their website and their team page, they basically had the same three guys that they've had on there since they announced it. So I have no idea why they need hundreds of thousands of dollars for a project that hasn't released anything yet. That is a mystery to me. Um, so that one was interesting on the list. Uh, and then finally, our last honorable mention is Shapeshift, who received between $1 and $2 million from Signature Bank in April. Um, and again, this is an honorable mention because we actually got a response from someone at the company, uh, Eric Voorhees, and he replied to the criticism on Twitter by saying, We have gotten nothing from U.S. taxpayer, Stacy. We are the taxpayer. We have had millions of dollars stolen from us. We took it. We took some of it back. Direct your scorn at the thieves. Um, now, in some ways, um, as someone who, uh, similar to Eric, doesn't uh, believe in the state myself, I don't necessarily have a problem with this argument in general. I don't necessarily disagree with the idea that if you are one of these people who has these beliefs that you should um, attempt to reclaim a portion of the money that was taken from you through taxation if you have plausibly legitimate means to do so. Um, but I think that 
responses like this are kind of being made in a vacuum because you are not just rescuing your taxpayer dollars back from the government. You are taking bailout money that in some way or another the government will expect someone to pay back. You are taking money that was printed as part of an economic stimulus uh, program, which will have a great inflationary effect on the economy as a whole. Also, as I already mentioned, you should keep in mind if the people who are making this argument that you are taking from a pool of money that was made available to people in a very limited way. There are hundreds of thousands, uh, or sorry, there are hundreds if not thousands of businesses who were not able to get any kind of loan because other businesses, in my opinion, a lot of businesses that not only have the resources to avoid going into bankruptcy, but could have comfortably retained a majority, if not all of their employees with no help, um, it, it's being taken by those businesses uh, instead of the businesses that will probably go into bankruptcy and will probably affect a lot of people's livelihoods and they don't, they won't have any other options. They won't be able to ICO their way out of this. And so actual small businesses run by people who were looking for thousands or maybe tens of thousands of dollars to survive instead of millions, um, not businesses run by millionaires and billionaires are going to be affected by your actions. As long as you are comfortable with that, that you are, yes, in a way, rescuing back money that you pay through taxes, but you are preventing other people from rescuing their money <laughs> and being able to survive then I guess this argument makes sense. Yeah, the, the thing that's really just irritating to me is the, the entire dynamic of who didn't get money because big companies like this applied. And it's just, <laughs> when you look at all of the people in this space, it's all of the shit coiners and scammers. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, after all of the money you have soaked up through manipulative dishonest just bag dumping on plebs heads through the last couple years you need a, a bailout from the government go fuck yourself yeah i mean i was looking through the list and i mean i have i might have to check it again but i did not see a lot of bitcoin focused businesses if any and that's kind of interesting because the argument that a lot of these companies make for why they or I should say Bitcoin exclusive businesses, the reason that a lot of these companies claim that they go into shit coins or list shit coins is because it makes money, it's profitable. And at the end of the day, it's like, okay, either there is a big difference between your principles or the way that you express your principles and the way that the these Bitcoin businesses express their principles, which aren't necessarily different from yours in terms of the ideological background, um, it seems that you've made some very different choices. And if it's true that you needed this money for your business to survive, why is that the case when it seems like a lot of Bitcoin businesses were able to, at least they made the decision to weather this without engaging in this program? I just think it's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. It's just like any any of these companies that isn't a legitimate business with employees like these these shit coin generators and bullshit like IOHK Electric Coin Company Consensus like like fuck you like y you have money sell your shit coins sell the bitcoins that you got for those shit coins well and it's also like a lot of these companies they were already working on a remote basis anyway they were they were based around the internet they were having meetings on the internet they lived in different states and sometimes in different countries so what were they what were they doing um that was so in, that was impacted so much by the lockdown or or the pandemic um in comparison to the rest of us like my my working situation didn't change because of the pandemic. I was already working remotely. So 
unless uh, these companies have some other business that was affected by the economic downturn, like uh, maybe invested too much in coins that didn't have any fundamental value, um, it makes no sense to me why they would say that the lockdown in particular affected their ability to conduct business. All righty. We ready for a blast from the past? Always. So, um, the Supreme Court of the state of New York has ruled that Bitfinex and Tether uh, have to go to trial um, in their dealings with the New York Attorney General's office. And uh, just for a quick sum up here, um, what happened was a large amount of the fiat currencies backing Tether um, in the custody of crypto capital, which turned out to be an unbelievably uh, shady company, just pretty much shell banking illegally all over the place um, and not actually informing those banks what the money was involved with. Um, and that money was seized by the US government, um, as well as a few other European governments. And then the New York Attorney General's office um, goes after them for not having fiat holdings to fully redeem all of the outstanding tether. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? The government takes your money and then takes you to court for not having the money that they took from you. Um, you know, just, just to kind of give context to this. But pretty much the rationale in the, the ruling was the the first um, kind of filing motion made by the New York Attorney General's office. Um, I, I, don't, I don't fully really understand the legal nuance of this, but it didn't actually constitute a, a kind of final or firm order from the court. It was a little more um, of a, a different um, legal process than just the court issuing a blanket order. And looking at the nature of that and how Bitfinex and Tether were trying to argue for that being dismissed, um, the court pretty much ruled that given the fact that they had in the past and acknowledged all of this operated in New York, um, held banks in New York, had services accessible to New York residents, and even had a um, C-level employee living in New York, um, in combination with effectively not making the proper argument in their motion to dismiss, um, that this filing was not a final order um, and was served improperly, um, that they have effectively waived their ability to make that argument um, because that was not the argument they made in their motion to dismiss. It, it was not made in that way. And so now this is going to have to go to court. And this is going to get, um, you know, this is really, I don't know where this is going to go here in a trial because strictly technically speaking, now that jurisdiction has been established and acknowledged, and this is going to trial, um, Tether did not have, um, after the seizure of that money, the outstanding um, balances needed to redeem all of the Tether in circulation. So there's a really strong case there for fraud. But, you know, I keep coming back to the core issue every time we've touched on this story in the show. Um, the entire reason they didn't have that money was because the government themselves seized it. So, like, I, I really, th there is no interpretation of this in my mind, except the New York Attorney General's office um, strategically attempting to attack a piece of important market infrastructure in this space. Like, without Tether, and the other stable coins that have popped up since then, um, these markets would not work efficiently. Like there would be major restrictions 
and how the fiat side of things could move around to arbitrage and keep all of the different global marketplaces in alignment with each other. And even with all of the other stable coins in existence, um, Tether has maintained a huge dominance in that space. And the operators of it haven't really been too um, willing to just bend over and do whatever the US government says. So like this to me, I, I see nothing going on here except that being attacked very strategically because they don't like the fact that that aspect of, of the market isn't just completely under their thumb anymore. And, you know, I'm kind of uh, on edge as far as how this could play out in court. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the kind of games they play. Um, kind of an unrelated story, but also kind of related in terms of it being a New York uh, based part of the U.S. government and uh, dealing with uh, banking kerfuffles is that um, I think it was on July 7th, uh, the New York State Department of uh, Financial Services announced that they had come to a settlement agreement. Well, not really. I mean, it was a criminal or something. They came to an agreement with Deutsche Bank um, that they would pay 150 million in penalties because of quote compliance failures um, because they had maintained a banking relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. And don't get me wrong, I mean the stuff in there in the in the in the uh, consent order like outlining those compliance failures is pretty bad. I mean literally. Uh, the, the portion that I'm going to include in my newsletter is that uh, a Deutsche Bank AML officer instructed the relevant transaction monitoring team to verify using internet searches that any woman involved with transactions related to Epstein uh, to the Epstein relationship was at least 18 years old and to only fra- flag transactions if they could not discern a rational reason for the transaction. So they were literally... And they were also aware of the plea agreement that he came to in Florida in 2008. And they were aware of the public reporting of the fact that he was being accused of what he's been accused of. And, but what I find particularly interesting about that situation is you basically have the U.S. government, albeit a a small portion of the U.S. government, but you have the U.S. government penalizing a bank for failing to um to properly vet a person and to maintain a relationship with them um despite knowing what they had been accused of and that's quite interesting because in the context of the florida deal that involved the u.s government letting go a guy and not not even telling his victims that he was going to be let go and that he'd been given a plea deal, um, letting literally let him letting him go and letting him be charged very leniently to the point where he was not even serving his entire sentence in Florida. It was supposed to be eighteen months, and it was only thirteen, and he was allowed to leave the prison for up to twelve hours a day, six days a week. That is not prison. That is a sleepover. So I just find it kind of disgusting (laughs) that the U.S. government is now trying to take a holier-than-thou position in terms of his relationship with banks and the facts that the banks that he, he banked with didn't do enough to monitor his activity when you literally had the government aware of and have evidence and victims speaking to them about what he had done and they let him go. I I find it hypocritical <laughs> to an extreme and I it, even though it's a different situation, I feel it's similar in that way because you have a government accusing someone of a crime that was caused by their actions. It was it was allowed to happen because of their actions. The alleged crime of not yeah. having enough money. It just goes to show these people don't enforce things or go after people to look out for their their citizens. They do it to protect their own interests. Yeah. 
financial surveillance for thee, but not for me. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess uh, these next two I'm just going to go through real quick, but uh, two awesome fucking examples of PSBT starting to eat the ecosystem. So uh, Ben Carmen, who's uh, working at Sherdbits, just dropped uh, on the 7th a app called the PSBT Toolkit. And this is really fucking awesome because I have been kind of thinking, uh, why isn't there a piece of software like this for a few months now? And boop, Ben drops this out into the world. But it's just a really simple um, GUI kit to work directly with uh, partially signed Bitcoin transactions. And so like for those not too familiar with it, it's kind of a way to break up the uh, the pieces of a transaction and then attach metadata so that wallet software knows you know what to do with it. Like an input would have uh, an XPub and the associated derivation path of that so that a, a wallet can find the appropriate key to sign with it or things like that. And this is pretty much just a generalized tool that allows you to manually fiddle with or subtract things or add things or even merge PSBTs together um, at a very granular level. Um, like you can specifically add um, UTXOs, um, add signatures individually, add um, scripts for an input, add, like I said, the, the key path, um, the SIG hash type, so which parts of the, the transaction a signature is committing to, um, add you know, fancy output scripts, um, the path for that. And then, you know, a specific um, kind of transaction level thing to just merge whole different PSBTs together. And this is pretty much like the easiest tool I imagine that exists out there right now to just create really complicated transactions or scripts and pass them around to actually get them signed um, as far as non-conventional shit that exists. And so this is really just an awesome thing. Um, anybody out there really comfortable working with their Bitcoin and, and knows what they're, they're doing in terms of, um, you know, don't create a weird script and then lose that script. Um, you know, you can just start playing around with weird random things now and you don't need a high degree of technical um, competency. You just need to kind of be aware of how the basics work and that you are um, kind of taking a risk if you start doing weird, advanced, non-standard things. Yeah, I'm going to have to make sure to add this um, to the, if, if Rodolfo hasn't already added it, um, this should probably be added to our wallets recovery guide because I think we have a section that lists tools like this and that would be good. Mm -hmm. But like this, is, this is going to be fun to play with. And then, um, fully noted, um, has also dropped their own, um, PSBT signers, um, toolkit so that, uh, you can effectively add, um, in the wallet, um, whole different key sets and kind of flag them as a PSBT signer and kind of move back and forth with the, the backend node to manage constructing a PSBT and moving it around. Um, and the wallet can just kind of figure out um, on the phone any keys that it has for a PSBT and automatically sign it. And another cool thing, um, you know, Mac products have the, the airdrop feature where you can kind of just over Bluetooth, um, I think it runs on, just drop files um, wirelessly between different Mac devices. Um, and they've integrated support for that um, to pass PSBTs around so that you can integrate, um, you know, let's say you want to make a cold card multi-sig or potentially just use a cold card. Um, this software can now, in a pretty simple user-friendly way, um, pass those around between different devices so you can get it to the cold card to have it signed. 
Um, and now there's still a few functions of this that kind of go back and forth between um, the, the node that the wallet's hooked up to, but they are planning on kind of moving that gradually to be something that can function completely offline. And so, like, yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of loosely paid attention to Fully Noted um, since they started, but like these last two features they've dropped, um, this is the only thing I am going to recommend for anybody I know who uses um, like Mac products at this point. Like that platform has historically been just ridiculously under supported in terms of all the features Bitcoin has. It just never had software that that would really take advantage of this. And Fully Noted has just completely turned that around 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Looks really cool. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I can actually deal with somebody who uses Mac um, without just cringing in the back of my head like i know they're they're not going to take bitcoin seriously because uh all the software on it sucks yeah it's uh mac is uh quite interesting like um i had to use i had to use one recently and what was it i could i couldn't for the life of me um it was something really stupid. Like I wanted to, um, I wanted to navigate back um, a folder, and I couldn't figure out how to do that in the because I'm not used to using Macs, and so I had to look up how to go back a folder <laughs> when I was in the, when I was in the the file manager. It was so ridiculous. So I was like, why is this so hard? Because like Linux, you usually you just click you just click on the prior folder and that's it. The in, in the interface, and I couldn't figure out how to do that on a Mac. It was so bizarre. Yeah, uh, I I have those moments whenever I've encountered them. But the thing that really just pisses me off is that the entire security feature for their App Store and requiring app signatures and trying to get around that, and then just little ways that they like really incorporate like virtual file systems into it it's just like i hate using mac stuff but like on some level it's like but it it babysits the normie better i guess i mean yeah i mean i wouldn't i don't necessarily have a problem in general of people using Macs because I think on the whole if you want a good combination of UX and security then for normal circumstances then a Mac is fine but I found it incredibly frustrating and I only use it for incredibly normy things mm -hmm. yeah it's like you know full, fully noted has been fucking nailing it on that and uh yeah, you know, that I think that's I don't know. I think that's really going to show um compounding results over the next year or two where a whole class of like device users aren't so under equipped in terms of tools anymore. Alrighty. So uh yeah. Wanna wanna dive into a group of morons that we talk about almost as much as Coinbase? I wouldn't say as much, but definitely frequent enough that I, when I name off all the episodes that we've talked about Brave Browser in, it's a long list. Um, but yeah, so on July 9th, the Bold Browser, which is formally uh, called the Braver Browser project, um, because it's a fork of the Brave Browser, uh, and it was prominently initiated after the controversy where the Brave Browser was auto-completing links to certain websites with their referral code. Um, if you want to hear more about that, that was in episodes 223 and 224. Um, th so they basically on July 9th tweeted that one of their contributors has been receiving legal threats. 
Uh, they say, due to legal threats sent to one of our community members by a certain party, specifically looking to harm them financially because of what this browser is forked from, we are immediately changing the name and re removing all association to the browser that shall not be named. Um, and this contributor, though he wasn't named in the thread, um, he tweeted himself and his name is Dean Van uh, Dukterin. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, but on Twitter, Dean. Um, and he tweeted on the same day that due to recent legal threats sent to me personally, I am hereby clarifying that I am not involved with the management of Bold Browser. I am a code contributor and made an unofficial Discord community, but that's it. Nothing else. I'm not even a co-owner of the GitHub repo anymore. Uh, then he said, spoke with the Bold Browser community and the new Twitter owner and GitHub owner promptly changed their t project title to remove all references to the other browser. Um, I thank them for their quick action to help protect their non-anonymous contributors from legal threats. And so for anyone who didn't see, when the, Bra when the project was initially launched, it was called the Braver Browser Project, and their logo was not the same logo as Brave Browser. It was a similar logo, um, but instead of a lion's head, it was a badger's head, and it looked quite distinct to me. It was the same orange color, but it was distinct enough that there should be... No, there there was not enough reference to actively be confusing people. Um, but according to Brendan Eich, uh, who confirmed that they were sending these legal threats, he said that it was done in defense of the trademark of Brave. He said a trademark can be lost if not defended. This is a bog standard and this is bog standard and necessary for any business. Mozilla protected Firefox the same back in the day, and as far as I know, still does as needed. Um, I mean, I d didn't look up whether that was the case, but I find it unconvincing to send legal threats to a random person contributing to the development of a project that in fact does not share the same name as your project. It was the, I mean, Braver Browser, it's close enough, that could be arguably a problem I don't know in terms of trademarks but they did have a different logo and they made it very clear that they were not they were not the brave browser and they very much didn't like you uh and they had a different logo and all of that um and they were also in the process of removing aspects of the brave browser code that remained that could have contained trademarked or copyrighted aspects that you might have tried to use against them and also, the Brave Browser code is registered under an open source license, so they're allowed to fork the code. There was no problem there. So I don't really get what the basis is for these legal attacks in any legitimate way. Um, and then about an hour ago, the Bold Browser Twitter tweeted, um, why we removed our existing GitHub repo. So now they've escalated to actually removing the repo. Uh, the contents of the forks were being cherry-picked for references to the original browser, those were then used in legal threats against one of our community devs to claim they're purposely causing financial damage to the creator. Even though we were already planning to start from scratch using the ungoogled chromi chrom chrom chromium codebase, uh, we wanted to keep the repositories public as deprecated for other coders to reference, but protecting our only non-anonymous contributor from legal threats takes priority. Whoever would assume that the threats were uh, highly standard slash normal may not have considered that one specific dev may have been picked out as the only non-anonymous contributor and may have been presented as a black hat operator, clearly, in quotes, sabotaging their multi-million dollar corporation. Uh, disclaimer, the above is entirely hypothetical and not about any party in, partic in particular. We wanted to include this disclaimer earlier, but couldn't due to Twitter's character limit. Um, I mean, of course, yes, they're they're skating the line there and saying that's not about any particular company, but it's pretty obvious who they're talking about. There's no one else who they could be talking about. So, yeah, I with that further explanation, I find that completely stupid because, like, seriously, every open source project that actually understands what open source means, none of them are going to go after another project that's been forked from them just because they have yet to completely go through all of the code and remove all of the trademarked and copyrighted material um, fast enough. Like, no open source project, if they're worth their weight, does that. That is completely disgusting for them to be engaging in that kind of behavior. Um, Especially, you know, 
as they pointed out, they're going after a random contributor. They're not even going after the leaders of the project. And why are they not doing that? Well, because the people running the project are anonymous and you it's a lot harder to go after anonymous people. So pick the guy out who actually uses his name um, and just make it clear to the rest of us why it's in, it's increasingly apparent that if you want to develop with these projects, um, especially if it's in any way related to these shitcoin ICO projects, you should probably do it anonymously because you don't know when it's going to come back to bite you in the ass and you're going to get sued for some stupid violation of trademark, <laughs> uh, or at least their attempt to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's really funny, you know, given a browser that was ostensibly started to give people an escape hatch from the greasy nature of large internet corporations and their advertising and surveillance practices, um, has time and time and time and time again just sunk to super greasy ass tactics exactly like that. Um, to try and get this browser adopted. Yeah. But, yeah. I guess it's not the uh, only browser lately um, having issues with things. Yeah, so you might know a bit more about this than me because um, I was not I was not aware that DuckDuckGo has a browser um, on mobile. Is is that actually the case? Because I've I've only ever used the search engine. When they say browser, do you mean like like search engine, or do you mean like browser browser? No, it's like an actual uh, mobile browser. That's um, I actually used that um, until I saw this. But yeah, um, this is uh, kind of shady. So the whole point of it is it's a privacy browser for mobile, um, you know, building off of the search engine, which is a privacy search engine trying to be the opposite of Google. Um, well, that browser on Android um, beams home every domain that you visit to DuckDuckGo's servers. So by using that browser, you are literally correlating whatever IP um, you're on right now to every single domain that you are visiting with that browser. Um, that's really kind of shady. Um, and they've reopened an issue on GitHub and are going to push an update app or update to the app. But like, yeah. Um, you know, I feel completely disgusted by that, and I immediately uninstalled that app. Um, like, as far as I'm concerned, like, I don't quite trust that company to the same degree that I used to. Like, I specifically got that browser to not have a, a, a major browser like Chrome that's tied into all kinds of Google services um, when I'm using a browser on my phone. And it was just zapping off every domain that I visited to DuckDuckGo's servers. Well, so to just explain kind of what's happening is that this has to do with them trying to grab the fav icons or fav icons. I don't know how mm -hmm. you're supposed to, but basically, I, yeah. The, favicon? The, yeah, favicon. So that's, that's what it's related to in the thread that's linked in the show notes. Um, and so at one point, this was nine days ago, because I think this issue is much older. I think it was opened last year. Yeah, it was open, issue open July 9th, 2019. So this is a very old issue. Um, but it recently got more attention because I guess it was posted to Hacker News. Um, and people were like, well, why is this issue being closed? Did it ever get fixed? And the nine days ago, the CTO actually did post in the thread saying... Um, Hi, all CTO of DuckDuckGo here. I thought I might it, it might be helpful if I briefly shared some of our internal thinking around this issue so folks can see how we got here and how we plan to move forward. The logic behind how we've been displaying favicons in our apps is a function of how we operate our private search engines. Since we already have an anonymous 
favicon service through our search engine using it has a number of benefits it avoids more requests to known non-anonymous websites that are visited it's way faster since it runs server side saves user bandwidth and the only external visible attribute is that the app is connecting to duckduckgo.com as the favicon location is actually encrypted in the path in transit to our team, utilizing this anonymous service we made uh, for the search engine seemed like an optimal principal choice across a set of criteria. We want to be clear that at no point was the actual visited domain otherwise exposed. This favicon service is fully anonymous on our end, and URL parameters like the favicon domain are encrypted in transit, just like the search engine with search queries. This is also why when this issue was raised in the past, we decided to keep the solution as is. At no point was this ignored. Um, however, we understand that there is an alternative method of getting the favicons locally that a lot of folks prefer while still maintaining our privacy standards. We also believe that method is in line with our product vision of privacy simplified, considering it's a somewhat simpler method than the one we have been using. So we went ahead today and implemented the change for both Android and iOS that will move uh, this logic onto the client and we will no longer be using the favicon service in our apps. These changes are currently in the release phase and are rolling out live now. We appreciate the feedback and exchange of ideas on this topic and on ways to further improve the privacy of our products in general. So they have responded and fixed it. So anyone using it as of now, you, that kind of, um, if you are concerned about that operation and don't agree with the way that they were handling it they've now changed it to not do that so that's what the cto has said yeah but that just like sketches me out you know like this was happening for a year like pretty much to the day almost like you know that that that's if if a service or a company is is really trying to offer a privacy related service and really do that like why why did this happen like there shouldn't need to be a a second call out to something that wasn't addressed a year ago to actually get something done about it like that's just viscerally i just my trust in them has dropped a notch. I mean, yes, it could have been handled better, but I like, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that they were doing this kind of thing. I mean, cause they are, I mean, they're a search engine, like that's what they are. So if you want to be a not, if, if you don't want someone to correlate your, searches you need to be using more tools than just DuckDuckGo to keep that anonymous um and also i mean there's a few alternatives like um what's the one out of the netherlands i can't remember um there's there's a search engine out of the netherlands that they allow you to like use a use tunneling when you when you use their search engine you can not only be using like Tor, for example, but then when you go to the individual websites, you can go through some kind of tunnel connection, which is interesting, but like besides that, um, there aren't a lot of alternatives to DuckDuckGo as a search engine. Um, whether, I mean, like like I said, I don't I because I don't use mobile, so I I didn't even know that this browser existed. I thought they just did a search engine, so I'm not as familiar with it and what other things it might have been doing. But um, I mean, I don't know I don't know what else you would pick um, besides DuckDuckGo if you wanted to have some semblance of privacy when you're doing searches on the internet. Yeah, and that's kind of just what bothers me. You know what I mean? But yeah, because like to compared to Brave, I mean, all things considered, because um, like there there's a uh, you can get the Brave browser on mobile. Um, I know that much. And when I had tried it out a few times, um, I mean, it was very good. It was fast, and I also like the fact that they're one of the only browsers that does like fingerprinting protection and things like that that's something that browsers don't do and they should do more 
So as much as I hate the Brave browser's past actions and stuff involving like crypto related stuff, um, I would still say, you know, if you if these are ki the kinds of features that you value, I mean, preferably, you know, you would you would get a developer to move them into a browser that you like more. But um, at the moment, that's one of the only places that it's offered and it's a free browser. And, you know, there are tons of people who have criticized other things related to its security and privacy offerings, but that's one thing that they do do. And so if you want that, I wouldn't say that you shouldn't use the Brave browser just because of their prior actions if they are offering a feature that is valuable. Yeah. Uh, let's just say I hope that the bold browser uh, fork kind of takes off. Yeah, right. especially in terms of... Um, I mean, I, I'm actually... I'm kind of wondering because I've heard for a number of years that there were people who've wanted to fork Brave and take out the bat token stuff and replace it with Bitcoin. And I don't know if these are the same people that I was like hearing about in Whispers, but um, I hope that that's going to be on the roadmap. Mm -hmm. ready for a little interesting update in uh the more legacy spectrum of the space though mm -hmm. so three interesting additions to um the avanti bank and trust out in wyoming's uh advisory board uh christopher allen um who some might know in this space um does a lot of work on identity and key management. He's also uh, one of the co-creators of the TLS standard. Uh, Bob McElrath, who was previously the head of uh, Fidelity Digital's blockchain department. And Katie Cox, a former uh, Federal Reserve bank regulator. And now the the thing i really want to concentrate on isn't so much katie but um bob and christopher because you know that that was all the the lack of competent engineers in this system was always going to be the thing that kind of um pigeonholed the pace of legacy institutions or conventional financial institutions from really taking advantage of the types of things that Bitcoin and other assets have to offer. And, you know, Avanti is specifically set up to be that kind of newer bridge in terms of the, the legacy fiat system and a conventional institution and the crypto space. And they're really starting to attract some seriously competent engineers in terms of Bitcoin and blockchain systems. And so, yeah, I, I really think that, you know, like the, the rant I went on um, regarding strike in the, in the last episode about being a Bitcoin bank um, and doing that right. I think Avanti is kind of setting itself up to just be a bank that does Bitcoin right. If you can kind of get the, the subtle difference in that it's more concentrated on the conventional, um, you know, more advanced finance side of a bank rather than just a, a consumer facing way to make uh, payments and hold your money. And I think that this is like Avanti is going to be, I think, the first bank that really starts trying to apply vaults in terms of, um, you know, Brian Bishop's design and starting to move into the direction of, of covenant like structures that allow kind of a clawback mechanism in terms of uh, a wallet being compromised. And I think that's going to be kind of a. I don't know, like uh, paving the road for other conventional institutions like JP Morgan, um, Chase, you know, all, all the big banks that, that everybody loves to hate. And it's really, given the open source nature of 
everything being built in this space. Um, if Avanti builds those kinds of things, um, you know, other banks are just going to be able to pick that up and apply it. So, yeah, I think I think this is going down a uh, a weird path in terms of it's awesome to see what Avanti themselves are starting to get into. But if this all remains in the, the scope of open source, then all of the other banks that we don't like are going to come pick those things up and start trying to apply them not too long after. Yeah, and we'll be talking more about this, I suspect, uh, tomorrow with uh, interviewing Jack Mollers. Mm -hmm. I think that one's going to be uh, really fun in terms of getting into the banking and Bitcoin side of things. All righty. Are we ready for full Shinobi autism? Always. <laughs> so, Although I still despise the fact that you're using autism as a pejorative. <laughs> um, so this is uh, something that actually caught my eye um, at the end of June. Um, I just... I did not have the time to really go through that um, before the last episode. Um, but I, I saw a write-up that Nadav Cohen uh, did on this concept for generalized Bitcoin channels um, that was put out by um, some cybersecurity groups and um, applied cryptography groups based out of um, Austria, the Netherlands, and Germany. Um, and I'm not actually sure exactly when this paper was published. But it's pretty much a um, new lightning channel um, construct design that's symmetrical. So both sides of the channel um, have the exact same transaction rather than right now where they kind of have a mirrored image where your funds are time locked um, and the other sides are not. And it accomplishes this without l2 and while having a coherent penalty mechanism in a single transaction on um, a single output that only the appropriate side can penalize um, if somebody submits an old channel state and it, it pulls this nice trick off using adapter signatures to kind of have two revocation secrets um, rather than one to penalize a party and now, kind of in, in the normal lightning channel state, um, each side has their own commitment transaction that has an output for the other side of the channel that's not time locked, an output to your side of the channel that is time locked and has a revocation key uh, for that path too, um, and then any other contract in, in flight in that channel. So the penalty key is a tie or tied to one of two or more outputs. Um, this would completely redo the entire commitment structure where there's a single transaction with a single output um, that forms the commitment transaction both sides have. Um, and then it has a closeout transaction after that that's time locked before it gives both sides of the channel their money. And now if we go back to the commitment transaction that both sides share in common, the script for that output allows a multi-sig spend to the timeout or the, the closeout transaction that's time locked. But it also has two revocation paths and each of those paths have two revocation secrets. They have the, the kind of conventional um, secret used now where it's effectively just a pre-image. Um, and then there's also um, the second secret, which is where the adapter signatures come into play. So in the update of a, a channel or the creation of a new channel state, um, both sides would have a second key and they would like a second public key, private key pair. And when they um, sign the um, commitment transaction that spends from the funding, um, they tweak that signature 
with the other side's um, new key that's in the picture now. And so effectively what happens is when one side um, goes to spend with an old state, um, you reveal that private key because I can take my tweaked signature and I can take the untweaked signature um, from that uh, old state that was published and subtract them and figure out the actual private key to your public key that I tweaked that signature with. And that's the second um, penalty pre-image. So that when somebody submits an old state, I get your, your untweaked signature and I can deduce your private key, but I haven't published mine, so you can't do the equivalent. And this allows this single output to only be penalized by the appropriate party. And so the real awesome thing here is that any kind of old state hitting chain um, is penalized before any real large transaction um, uh, hits the chain. So like in, in a normal um, lightning channel, if we had a bunch of HTLC payments in progress, all of those outputs would be in that commitment transaction. And I would have to penalize each individual output you know, separately. But with this new channel construct, we would attach HTLCs or other contra or constructs to that second closeout transaction rather than directly in the commitment transaction. And so any kind of theft attempt is way more efficient in terms of block space and what initially hits the blockchain and then what has to hit the blockchain to penalize um, the malicious party in this channel. And so th th this is just a way more efficient um, channel construct that is symmetrical in the way an L2 channel works and still has a penalty mechanism baked in, um, but that only allows the appropriate party to, to penalize if an old state hits the chain. And it could work completely compatibly with the current um, channel design without anybody who's not updated to this having to care um, whether other participants in a payment route have. So this is really fucking awesome. And yeah, um, I, I really don't have anything else to say. <laughs> cool. Shinobi autism over. My turn. Mm-hmm. Well, folks, uh, so on July 6th, uh, one of the Winklevi declared that Bitcoin marks the beginning of the end of surveillance capitalism or the beginning of the end for surveillance capitalism. And um, I mean, this isn't really a story, but I thought this was an interesting statement to highlight because um, given that a few people like John Carvalho and also Chris pointed out in the replies, um, Tyler is the co-founder and CEO of the Gemini Exchange, and Gemini pays chain analysis, chain analysis uh, for blockchain surveillance uh, as part of their, you know, operations. And they even have a tweet from April 2019 that Chris pointed to where it says, Our chief compliance officer, Michael Brew, emphasizes that as a New York trust company, we are required to monitor transactions onto and off our platform. Automated solutions like chain analysis help us to fulfill our regulatory obligations. Um, side note, there will be a very interesting story in the newsletter, <laughs> the next newsletter coming out about them for this month. Um, but anyways, um, the the reason that this statement is interesting is because uh also if any of you have actually read the writings of the woman who basically coined the term surveillance capitalism i'm sure that if you asked her she'd think that uh companies like chain analysis and also gemini like as an exchange in general would be a good example of the practice of surveillance capitalism because in a paper from 2015 uh, published before she made that very massive long book, she wrote that surveillance capitalism involved uh, basically computer-mediated work from earlier generations of mechanization and automation designed to substitute for or simplify human labor. 
And what is a blockchain surveillance system, if not the automation of law enforcement labor? She also said in the same paper that um, the extraction processes that make big data possible typically occur in the absence of dialogue or consent, despite the fact that they signal both facts and subjectivities of individual lives. These subjectivities travel a hidden path to aggregation and decontextualization, despite the fact that they are produced as intimate and immediate uh, tied to individual products and contexts. And of course, in surveillance capitalism, she is talking about the commodification of personal information. And while an exchange may not necessarily do that, all they do do in some contexts, if they engage, for example, in a sale of their company to another party, uh, and include obviously customer data and that, that is, that in a way makes it a commodity. Um, uh, blockchain surveillance certainly is involved in the practice of turning, you know, individual projects and contexts, um, and intimate details of people's lives into commodities in a way, because like the whole idea of blockchain surveillance is that they turn users into these identifiers and then they track them and try to associate them with activity on a blockchain and then they then sell this service where they whether they do it in a in a so-called anonymous anonymized way or not that is exactly what they're doing if they're selling it to a company or to a government they are they are a great example of surveillance capitalism because they make money off of that as well. They profit off of turning people into data objects. And so anyway, of course, uh, it's a bit, it may seem a bit unfair to be judging the validity of Tyler's statement in the context of his hypocrisy because um, aside from that conflict, um, I actually don't disagree with the statement itself because one of the reasons that many companies, especially Google, which is a big focus of um, the book and the paper on surveillance capitalism, uh, Google um, spearheaded the advertising surveillance model early on as a way to fund internet companies and internet activity partly because there wasn't a way for people to effectively pay for internet-based content and services, um, especially when it came to micropayments. Um, that was just not really a possibility back then. So I do believe in the long term that Bitcoin will ultimately change that, but that would require a lot, lot more mainstream adoption to satisfy the bold claim that it will end surveillance capitalism as a whole. I mean, it's one thing to say that some people will be able to use Bitcoin in order to opt out of it by only using services where they actually pay for the content and the service and they don't, the service doesn't therefore have to rely on sucking up as much information about them as possible in order to operate. But in terms of ending, ending that apparatus as a whole, that is going to involve a lot more people, a lot more time and a lot more development. And uh, in my opinion, <laughs> um, Tyler is not one of the people who is exactly putting a lot of resources into that because as uh, Bashko replied, he said, looking forward to Gemini supporting or sponsoring privacy-focused Bitcoin developers and leading the way by providing liquidity for Lightning Coin joining CoinSwap users. And of course, he's saying that because... Gemini has not done that so far, even though another a number of exchanges, other exchanges are doing that, either donating directly themselves or donating to grant pools. And so if Tyler wants to put his money where his mouth is, he should maybe put that money towards Bitcoin privacy projects. Just a thought. Yeah. The instant I saw that tweet, I was just like, this is the most pathetically hollow virtue signaling I have seen this week. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, I mean, I'll get into this more in the newsletter, but then he, I think it was like the next day, he tweeted that he was surprised about how many people were confusing surveillance capitalism for government surveillance. And it's like, yes, those are, those are two different things. But there is an argument to be made that the reason surveillance capitalism as a system is so successful 
is because the government is not only motivated to support systems like that because it enables their intelligence services to get more information about people through these third parties, but they are also not particularly motivated to fix the vulnerabilities that these companies and apparatuses take advantage of in order to do surveillance capitalism because people just willingly give up their data and don't have control um, over it. Um, they don't have a motivation to fix that, um, or they do only in the context of possibly protecting their own citizens from foreign influence. But there, there's kind of a weird there's kind of a weird conflict of interest when it comes to a government's motivation to actually practice national security because they don't want to give their own citizens enough privacy that they can't exploit them, but they want to give them enough so that other governments can't exploit them. So it's a bit of an issue. Um, and I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say the government surveillance is necessarily separate from surveillance capitalism because then also, one of the reasons why government surveillance is so pervasive and successful, and I use successful to mean widespread and continuing, despite all of its issues, um, the reason it's successful is because of private companies who are practicing surveillance capitalism. They are, they are buying the services of these companies because they themselves would not be capable of innovation in any way comparable to what these companies are doing to produce the the tools necessary to do that work. So I I I I'm surprised that someone who you know uh, likes to you know tout the the Harvard way and the fact that they went to Harvard and all of that and that they're sophisticated uh, financial service people don't know that. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, oh, boy. So I think it's time. Oh, is, is it time for the con base stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so basically a couple hours ago, I think, um, the block has once again been looking through uh, the government contracting databases, and I don't remember, I don't know if this one just recently popped up or maybe I just missed it when I went to look myself, but there is now a active contract between Coinbase Analytics, well, Coinbase Inc. as a whole, and specifically Coinbase Analytics, which is Neutrino rebranded. Um, there is now a active contract with some money already sent or on the way on the way to being sent between Coinbase and the U.S. Secret Service under the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and that is interesting because the block uh, had previously found in those databases potential contracts between Coinbase and the IRS and DEA. Those, um, it's kind of unclear what happened. One of them is still up. It's, it's available, but the deadline for when they were expecting a response, I think, has since passed. So now it's kind of just sitting there past due, and it doesn't look like they have taken it up according to that entry. So it's a bit unclear. And then I think the one for the DEA actually got 404'd. Um, I would have to check... I would have to check how the database works in terms of like when a because theoretically, if the contract was accepted, it would appear similarly to how the one with the U.S. Secret Service appears, which is that the contract has been accepted and then they show the amount of money and the stat like the status of the contract, and that didn't happen with the DEA one. So I'm kind of wondering either whether. Maybe it was determined to be too sensitive to have on a publicly accessible database like that, and so maybe they just disappeared it. Or if maybe, like the IRS contract, it wasn't accepted, and so nothing has been done and it's just been closed. Um, it's not clear, but at this point, we don't know. We don't, it doesn't appear that Coinbase actually went into a contract with the DEA or the IRS, which does not mean that they don't want to because they were they were engaged in the offer um 
but we don't we just don't know at this point but we do now know that apparently coinbase is now selling their blockchain surveillance system to the u.s secret service um based on the page it doesn't tell anything about what uh sorry i gotta sneeze one second Achoo. yeah so it doesn't say on the contract page um what the service is being contracted for but the amount i think is like one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and it's also a multi-year contract that i think expires in 2024 or something like that i am um, that's what i remember i i don't have it open at the moment but yeah so coinbase has a contract with the us secret service who knows what they want to use it for um but yeah, one one more nail in their coffin, I guess. Yeah, that honestly the one thing about that that stuck out to me was the amount. Like that just seems really low value unless this is some kind of like pilot thing where there's an opt out clause or like they're just contracting them to like pull information like when they request or something like not actually like fully utilize their service for everything or like maybe like just giving software to secret service agents but like an active like constant um service provision like that just seems like a really low amount of money for that to me yeah, I mean, like you said, the only explanation I can think of is that maybe this is one of the first times that they're offering it to law enforcement, and so they just want, they're just they just giving them a discount for them to test it out. I mean, they certainly, like, I mean, they paid, it was over $10 million for, for Neutrino when they acquired it, so they definitely have a some work to do in terms of making that money back that they paid. Um, and then they also, well, according to Brian, they lost the team or they let go of the team. Who knows if that actually happened? Um, but they do need to make some money back uh, plausibly. So yeah, they. Sh I would have expected them to charge a lot more. But um, I mean, I saw some people suggesting under the tweet for that article that possibly Coinbase is lowballing the price because this offering might be connected to some sec stuff as in they're trying to gain favor with regulators and so they're saying hey we'll give you a discount for this thing that you need yeah i could see that with as much money as they probably have to burn just get the foot in the door and then worry about renegotiation later Either way, one hundred and eighty thousand uh, dollars, one hundred eighty thousand taxpayer dollars are now going to Coinbase to uh, do blockchain surveillance. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, are we ready for a tale of another broken hardware wallet? I think we have a few of those today. Well, in a different sense, uh, yeah. But this, this is, uh, yeah, actually break, break. So um, Kraken's um, security labs that's been doing uh, analysis of different hardware wallets for a while now uh, found a potential route for a supply chain attack on a Ledger Nano X. Um, the newer um, S variant that has the uh, Bluetooth functionality so that you can use it with mobile. And um, yeah, there's really kind of two factors to this that open this up. And both to some degree are kind of cringy. So the original Nano S um, effectively had the MCU, like the, the non-secure chip, and then their proprietary secure element, and all of the peripheries, the USB, um, the buttons, the screens, all directly connected to the MCU, 
And the only thing the secure element connected to was the MCU. Um, in the Nano X, um, this has been mostly changed where there's direct connections from the screen and the input buttons to the secure element. Um, but the MCU still controls all the USB connections. So in order to pull off this attack pretty much, um, you would have to intercept um, a ledger Nano X before it got to the customer and before it had been initialized. And this is where it gets kind of cringy. Um, the JTAG um, connection, pretty much the, the debug uh, connection for the device, um, is open and usable until the first time that a ledger signed application is loaded on the device, at which point um, it's completely shut down and unable to be used from that point. Um, and the logic for this is for users to be able to connect to that and verify the firmware that's loaded on the device. Well, um, Ledger doesn't actually publish anywhere the information necessary to verify the firmware in the first place. So cringe. Um, this would allow uh, malicious firmware to be loaded on the device. And because the MCU controls all of the USB connection, um, it can present itself selectively and look genuine um, to the, the helper app. And it can also pretty much be turned into a bad USB that can issue input commands um, to the computer it's hooked up to. And now here's the second part where it gets kind of cringy. Um, the screen does connect directly to the secure element, but there is still one trace connecting to the MCU. And that can be used to turn the screen off while the device is still on and functional and accepting input. And so pretty much the, the attack here um, would involve, um, and there's actually a, a third piece of cringe coming. Um, I forgot to label that as cringe. Um, would You would get the compromised nano, um, you would plug it in, um, and could effectively have the screen turned off um, and some malicious software on the computer um, tell the user that the device is not responding, please hold the buttons down to reset it. And I don't have to explain that you could so easily trick so many normies with something like that. While the malicious software would feed a transaction sending your coin somewhere and you would just hold the buttons down and the secure element would sign the uh, transaction. Well, um, the official Ledger app for Mac OS um, that connects to this device is not signed by a Ledger um, developer key account. Um, it's not registered with Apple. So it shows up um, with the warning, um, can't be opened. You know, Apple doesn't know if this is malicious or not. And their own installation process for Mac um, involves showing users how to bypass that warning. Um, so yes, again, so many normies could be tricked into downloading the malicious application that would facilitate this attack. Uh. So now I wanna, I wanna again point out, like in order to really pull this off, you would have to be able to intercept the device um, being shipped to the customer and actually pull this off and target their machine um, or trick them into downloading malicious software. Um, so yeah, pretty much if you can intercept the device, you can put something in the package to go trick them and to download it. Um, but that's still a, a decent, you know, somebody has to know that you are ordering that somehow where it's going. Um, even if it's just snatching it off the porch, like have some viable way uh, of intercepting that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty bad. So um, they have released um, as of July 8th, um, a firmware patch for this, and they are now disabling the uh, 
JTAG trace uh, by default when shipping. But yeah, um, they somehow managed to take the practicality of a supply chain attack, which has a, a pretty high um, you know, cost and is very involved to pull off and made it, in my opinion, really damn easy um, compared to the, the theoretical supply chain attacks that have been documented or posited in the space before. So uh, yeah, um, this is why I personally don't use um, something that is this closed source. But uh, if anybody out there does, um, you should update your firmware. And you should be very careful if for some reason you end up um, buying one of these devices in terms of initially getting it and making sure it hasn't been tampered with. Mm hmm. Almost like um, tamper proof stuff might be useful. Mm hmm. Or should I say tamper evident? Mm hmm. Being, you know, one of the companies that has never done that in this space. Also, SGX. Mm hmm. So, yeah. Um, Shinobi's moral of the story, um, don't use fucking Ledger. Um, so much of it is closed source, um, you just have to trust them. All right. I guess uh, this last one is not really um, too much to it. But uh, Wasabi has announced that as of this point going forward, they are no longer going to be um, spending efforts maintaining compatibility um, with the Trezor. So pretty much, um, you know, from April to June um, this year, they broke backwards compatibility three times in two months during updates. And... Um, you know, they've just decided um, any change that breaks backwards compatibility from Trezor at this point, they are not going to spend resources maintaining compatibility with it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I said this is probably going to happen. And I doubt Wasabi is going to be the last project in the space to go this route. But if you just keep breaking and changing things and destroying compatibility between your product and other projects in this space... Um, they're just going to stop supporting your shit because you are being a fucking ignorant asshole who is just dumping all kinds of work on shit tons of other people because you can't work within the, the ethos of open source where, you know, you don't just break things. So, yeah, um, I doubt that they're going to be the last. And, um, yeah, karma's a bitch. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, that's going to obviously impact users the most who have, you know, been using their Trezor device with Wasabi, and that's really unfortunate that now they're going to have to figure out either getting a new hardware wallet or um, and migrating all of their you know, coins that they want to use with Wasabi to that, or possibly, you know, some of them might just give up on using Wasabi because the whole migration process is too complicated. And so that's really unfortunate that the result of Trezor's actions might be that, you know, fewer people are taking advantage of privacy tools. Yeah, you know, that's kind of why I went off on... um huge rant if i remember correctly when we covered their breaking changes um to half the things in this space um you can't just meme about being open source and, and protecting the user through open source when you're constantly breaking compatibility with no heads up to half the projects in the space like you're just using that as a marketing meme and you know, it sucks and you're right there, but if that's how it goes, then in my opinion, that's just going to more transparently show that Trezor is kind of full of shit in a way in, in memeing themselves as open source. And they're just pulling users into a walled garden with no privacy. 
Well, I mean, open source doesn't necessarily mean that you're interoperable with other open source projects, but I do think in general, as as we've uh, Rodolfo and I have highlighted with wallets recovery, um, the interoperability in this space is quite poor. <laughs> so uh, this is definitely an example of that where, you know, one service making changes and not considering the broader ecosystem and how things relate to each other and work with each other can end up leading to even less <laughs> interoperability. Well, see, that's the thing. I don't see Trezor as a service at this point. Um, you know, like all other devices like that, they're platforms and all kinds of stuff get built or gets built on that platform. And, you know, when you just throw yourself out there as an open source platform and you keep breaking backwards compatibility with no heads up, no phase out, no anything, um, you're, you're not being a responsible platform. Like you're not actually thinking about the users and the consequences to you, or your users and all the different ways they are using your platform and things built on top of it. But yeah, I mean, how it's going to play out, we'll see. But uh, I predict over time, uh, more projects making the same decision. Alrighty. Um, final, final thoughts? thoughts? Um, so I don't know if I have any others, but my first final thought is just that um, if anyone didn't see it, I was on, I think it's called the Total Bitcoin Podcast um, with Kayvon Devani and Stephanie. I think that was on Tuesday. Um, and I talked about Bitcoin privacy and investigative journalism and basically ranted for over an hour about that. So if you want to hear me rant for an hour straight about those topics. Um, you can check that out. Uh, just go to my Twitter feed. How did I miss that? How did I miss that? I don't. I don't know. I wasn't aware that you missed it. I mean, I didn't bring it up, but. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna have to go check that out. Um, but yeah. Um... I don't know, I guess re really all I got is uh, this is going to be dropping after I push that. But uh, we just did in the, the Dragon's Den another uh, in the Dragon's Maw panel show on the the civil unrest and, and yada yada. Um, the, the shit show that is 2020. So uh, yeah, uh, you guys should go give that a listen. Uh, I think it was a pretty fun interesting conversation that uh let's just say it started with concrete um situations and things and just kept going into the abstract philosophy of politics and society and uh i think it's well worth the listen and uh give everybody a lot to think about as far as everything that's been happening this year but uh yeah i guess catch you later punks hope you enjoyed bye Hello, <laughs> <laughs>